All right, everyone. Hello, welcome to PyData Global uh, 2021. I'm Florian. I'm the moderator for this session. And with me today, we have Paco Nathan, who's going to be talking about graph thinking. So Paco is a managing partner at Darwin and a lead committed to PyTech's rank and KGLAB. Uh, with core expertise in data science, natural language, uh, com cloud computing, and roughly 40 years of tech in industry experience. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, ranging from Bell uh, Labs to early, st early stage startups, he was an advisor for Amplify Partners, Recog Recogni, uh, Kunfu AI Primer, uh, as well as being a director uh, at community and com of community evangelism at Databricks and Apache Spark. So uh, without further mumbling on my side, uh, I hand over to you um, and uh, everybody enjoy the talk. Uh, yes, very grateful to get to present here. And the title is Graph Thinking. Uh, the slides are all online. This is talking about open source. And uh, actually the slides have a lot of links out to primary sources and different tutorials and videos and whatnot. So um, I, I try to err on the side of having too many links in the slides. Um, so hopefully that can be a resource. Uh, and just as far as who I am, uh, you know, I, I made the mistake of studying AI uh, many years ago and uh, against all warnings. And, uh, you know, the lesson is that if you really like something, stick with it for 30 or 40 years and it'll probably become very useful. Um, I did have some great opportunities along the way. I got to be a guinea pig for something new that was being launched called AWS. And I uh, got to work a lot on, on some of the services like Elastic MapReduce. Um, and uh, also, I, I, as Floyd mentioned, I, I had been uh, Databricks some years ago, back during the, the hyper growth period, got to be a community evangelist for Apache Spark. Um, I've been involved in a lot of conferences too, like TripleCon and Strata Data and, and other conferences, now more in the graph space. Um, and speaking of that, here's a link to some conferences, both recent and coming up. Um, but I'd like to talk about graph thinking, and this is about how to leverage graph technologies, especially in the context of uh, Python, PyData stack, if you will. But first off, people ask, well, why would I want to be doing graph technologies? What's, what's the big deal? Why is this useful? And so let me give a little bit of a story here, just briefly. Uh, imagine that we're somewhere in the woods. And in fact, to make this a little bit more interesting, let's say we're in a medieval village somewhere in the Black Forest. Um, and uh, I, I do a lot of work with uh, colleagues in Germany, not too far away from the Black Forest. Um, okay, so in this village, there's a pub. Pat tends the pub, and Pat has a couple of friends, Hanna and Thomas. And then Hanna works the fields, grows the grain, and has another friend, Aiden. Thomas raises poultry, buys grain from Hanna, and has another friend, Brenda. Aiden works the mill, so, you know, buys the grain from Hannah <clears throat> and has a friend named Chris. Brenda works the brewery. Brenda buys grain from Hannah and produces beer. Has a friend named Kim. Chris works the bakery. Chris buys eggs from Thomas and flour from Aiden, makes bread to sell back to Pat. And then Kim works the recyclery and Kim buys organic waste from Brenda and Thomas uh, and, and then provides fertilizer for Hannah. And so here you can see in the context of a, a small village, seven businesses, let's say, there are these relationships between the businesses, who is friends with whom, who sells to whom, what do they sell, um, what do they consume? And so we have a graph and it's describing really a circular economy for this little village. Now, if we were to take and represent this in terms of a relational database, you'd get something like this when you, when you get to normal form. You know, you would, you would have your normalization with your, your keys and whatnot, and yeah, I've got an, an ERD over on the side. And that's well and proper for being able to do SQL queries. But as far as a domain expert being able to understand the patterns that are going on in the relationships in this village, it totally tears that apart. It's very difficult to see these patterns once you've normalized for SQL query optimization. But when you have a complex context, these kind of network views instead are a way of bringing the data closer to people who can really make sense of it. 
especially the people who have the domain expertise. They tend to have more intuitive grasp of these kinds of network views. And that acknowledges a few things. One is the context has a lot of complexity in it. Two is there are emergent patterns. And then three, we need to be able to make informed decisions by perceiving those patterns. And those assumptions are a bit different than what we would typically see in like business intelligence based on SQL. So thinking about patterns, here's an example. Let's say that Hannah is relatively new to the village. She'd like to expand her business. She's noticed that Brenda is a good customer, buys a lot of grain. Who are the other villagers who are similar to Brenda? So by leveraging graph technologies, we can go out and see that Chris also similarly sells product to Pat, <clears throat> sells waste to Kim. Um, and so that, that brings up the question, could the bakery be using unmilled grain directly? Maybe they would make malt. Um, and so maybe Chris is a customer prospect. And another kind of pattern that you see in graphs is, who are the customers of my customers? And you can imagine that while this could be done with a, a query in a database, a SQL query, if you're looking three, four, five, 10, 20 hops out, this becomes a very complex kind of problem. And it's much more amenable toward graph algorithms. So for instance, here, Chris, Pat, and Kim are each a minimum two hops away. Again, Chris is looking like a pretty good customer prospect. And okay, let's imagine that there's a tech billionaire who uses time travel to relocate back to a medieval village in the Black Forest. And uh, you know, this billionaire wants to acquire the most influential businesses. Uh, who are the best acquisition targets? Well, if you were to run a graph algorithm called between a centrality based on just this simple data, you can see that Hana is really clearly one of the most central uh, characters in this whole village uh, in terms of the business flows. Chris is a second one in terms of ranking for centrality. Um, and of course, as we get much larger graphs, this is less obvious just to a casual viewer, but very easy to, to pull out using graph algorithms. Now, I wanna shift over and say, this idea of complexity and understanding emergent patterns is very important. Um, there's, if you've ever heard the term known knowns or unknown unknowns, and some unfortunate uses of them. Uh, it really, that goes back to uh, Dave Snowden, who was at IBM back in the 90s, came out with something called Kinevin. And it was a framework for decision-making. And of course, when we're working in data science, we are supporting decision-making. So what they said with Kinevin was there's four contexts. Simple is one kind of context where you have established facts, you just categorize the needs, you apply the rules, the best practices, and you know uh, an untrained worker can do this. Then there's a more complicated kind of context where it's not something that you can solve with just best practices. Instead, you have to have somebody go in and do analysis. Uh, and then expert analysis leads to assessing the facts, coming up with a response that leaders take. But then you can get into a complex business scenario where best practices don't work. There's no simple answer. You must probe the situation, you must sense the patterns and make an informed decision based off of these patterns. And this is where businesses tend to fall apart because they, they often will use analysis tools, data analysis tools that are based on a simple context or maybe a complicated context, but does not provide affordances for a complex context. And as a leader, when you apply overly simplified approaches to a complex problem, you end up with much bigger problems. And of course, in the world today, we see very complex global problems like global pandemics, global supply chain, uh, global climate crisis, uh, many things that are very complex and must, we must be grappling with in terms of data. Also though, um, in terms of pedagogy and learning theory, there's a very, very similar kind of effect we see that when we're teaching novices, people, when they're first learning a subject, they start out by having some small facts that they're learning, memorizing, memoizing, if you will. And these are typically disconnected facts. As people progress and become more advanced, they tend to start to chain these facts together. And then when people become more competent practitioners, they tend to you know, become a, a walking decision tree. Um, they come up with rule hierarchies and are able to make decisions based off of these kinds of, like I say, decision tree structures, which they have cognitively. 
But then when you move into being an expert in a field, you learn how to break those rules. You learn where are the exceptions. And the cognitive structures that you develop are graphs. And this should be a very good clue going forward in terms of guiding AI, um, that when people acquire expertise, they are doing internal modeling based on graphs. So these things align. How do business leaders handle complex situations? How do people gather expertise from a cognitive uh, um, psychology standpoint? And how do we calculate things with data? These are all sort of aligning, pointing toward opportunities for leveraging graph patterns, especially in 21st century kinds of problems. Now there's a related thing that's very important. It's called ambiguity aversion. This comes out of cognitive psychology, also behavioral economics. And the idea is that a lot of people, when they're faced with complexity and uncertainty, they, they tend to want to avoid it and move away towards something that's much simpler. Um, and unfortunately, again, when you apply overly simplified approaches to a complex situation, you end up with even bigger problems. Um, so I've, I've linked out here, uh, there's some great talks. Uh, there's one especially on toward data science going over ambiguity or version. And I, I want to shout out uh, a good friend and colleague, uh, Jürgen Müller at BSF. Jürgen and I have put together a lot of these materials. He really gets credit for a, a lot of this about the village. Um, but there's some more if you want to go into detail on it. Um, so now let me talk a bit more about graphs before I start into the open source side. Um, when we talk about graphs, usually we have entities, we have relations between the entities, there are different attributes on these. Um, in terms of uh, some types of graph work, we have controlled vocabularies that we use to describe our shared definitions. And so these are, these are kind of schema that's overlaid on the graph. And frankly, if you've ever worked with object-oriented programming, like in Python. Uh, if you're familiar with working with class hierarchies, none of this should be unfamiliar. Um, there's a lot of correspondence between what we do with graphs and controlled vocabularies and what people do when they're programming with class hierarchies. Now, in the graph space, there's a couple different prevailing views. One is the, the semantic web, W3C kinds of technologies, and these are great for a lot of applications. Um, but then there's also the property graphs, label property graphs, which were more popular in the graph databases. And uh, there is work in progress to align these two. It, it is possible, I can verify that it's possible to have a label property graph with a RDF overlay. Um, so there's really nothing stopping using both of these. Um, however, you know, when we look, uh, I, I'm involved with a community that's called Knowledge Graph Conference. Uh, and I've been curating a, a list, a public list. Please add to it if, if you want. Um, but we're, we're tracking at least 40 different graph database vendors currently. Um, but yet when we look at the large industry use cases, they're really more concerned with scalable graph compute, not with database. I mean, frankly, enterprise firms already have SAP and Oracle and all that. Um, and, and really this recalls the scenario of the mid 2010s when there are a whole bunch of MPP vendors out. They're all based on Hadoop during distributed SQL. And then Spark came along and said, well, actually your problem is about scalable compute, not so much database features. And so I, I think there were kind of that sort of nexus again. Uh, we'll probably see a lot more push toward horizontal scale out and compute as, and less and less about graph databases. Um, the other thing that's going on, of course, is graph neural networks. Uh, we've seen some really fascinating work over the past uh, five years or so uh, in terms of being able to represent graph problems with deep learning, uh, either by doing embeddings or even more directly by doing graph neural networks. And there's an emerging term called geometric deep learning. Uh, I really would point towards some people like Michael Brunstein and uh, Masej Vesta. Uh, there's great projects like PyTorch Geometric, uh, GraphGem out of uh, Stanford and SNAP. Um, and, and this is a way of sort of blending between domain expertise being represented in graphs and AI applications that leverage deep learning. Also, primary sources, there's a really great history of this by uh, Claudio Gutierrez and, and Juan Cicada recently. Uh, and also just going back, the foundational paper, of course, was Natasha Noe and Deborah McGinnis, 2001. And even going back into the 19th century, Charles Peirce uh, had references to knowledge graphs back then. So real quick, let's talk about the business side. Um, a lot of people, when they talk about data, they think about tables. They think about rows and columns, tabular, tabular representation, spreadsheets. 
Realistically though, when you're working with spreadsheets, when you're working with SQL, they have graphs embedded in them. Uh, spreadsheets have dependency graphs, SQL queries all have complex query plans that are, that are DAGs. Now, a problem is that if you are working with graph, you're working with a complex scenario and you try to overly simplify it, you end up creating tech debt. And so we see this with spreadsheets. I will shout out to uh, a friend, uh, Filene Hermans uh, in Netherlands, uh, who did her PhD about spreadsheets and just how much tech debt is looming out there. Um, and so it's really interesting that over the past year, there's been a real mind shift. Gartner in 2020 was saying that graphs, you know, whatever. And then in February, they did an about face and they said, well, we're at about 10% penetration for uh, graph technologies and analytics right now. But we estimate that by 2025, we'll see 80% of graph and data analytics will be using graphs or data analytics will be using graphs. And currently about at least 50% of their inquiries about AI are regarding graph technologies. So Gardner is pushing that graphs have, have reached a turning point. And, and part of that is this. Graphs allow you to expose metadata and business rules. And a lot of this is typically swept under the rug. And that leads to problems like compliance, uh, GDPR, other kinds of risks. Definitely tech debt. So I wanted to share, um, you know, I think a lot of people, they hear graph and they think, oh, that's just like large social graph at the big tech giants. It's not true. Um, there's actually the, the big verticals that we see are in finance, pharma, and manufacturing. They tend to have advanced graph practices, um, you know, and, and the typical kind of problems you're dealing with are like data integration across business silos, uh, being able to recognize patterns in terms of shapes or motifs grappling with complexity and uncertainty that would be very difficult to manage in a relational database, uh, NP hard problems like disambiguation, and, and places where details, zooming into details is more important than say aggregate counts like you would do in, in a lot of data science. So some examples, I'll definitely point, um, Albert Laszlo uh, Barabasi is doing fantastic work with network medicine. Uh, definitely in drug discovery, you see Novartis and AstraZeneca. I think that St uh, Stefan Reiling's work, uh, some of his talks uh, about using graphs for Novartis are really astounding. Definitely we see this in Siemens and Bosch and BASF and others in manufacturing. Um, uh, Jin Luna Dong has some great talks out of Amazon with the product graph, um, on and on, uh, definitely Refinitiv and Bloomberg and others uh, in, the, in the fintech space. And there's some links there to some references about them. Another area is climate science. Uh, I work with a really interesting group uh, in the US, the three agencies that are involved with climate science have what they call the Earth Observatory, that's NASA, USGS, and NOAA. And they're doing a lot of work with large scale graphs. Um, okay, so uh, one other part that's important is a little bit of graph theory. Uh, there is an area that we have called algebraic graph theory, where we can transform from a graph into a matrix or a vector or a tensor. Um, and that leads to something that's called uh, non-negative matrix factorization. It's been used a lot. Um, there are really fantastic resources for this, but it's not the only trick. Um, sometimes what you need to do is blend both symbolic representation and numeric representation, because you know there are things that leverage numeric representation, deep learning is one of them, but other things require the symbolic part, especially when you want to have explainable machine learning models. Uh, and so I, I, I tried to grapple with, with exploring this topic and I came out with uh, something called, you know, thinking sparse and dense with, with apologies to Daniel Kahneman. Um, but there are certainly types of data science work that, that require more sparse, sparse approaches. You see this typically like in data preparation. Um, these are generally bandwidth limited. Whereas you see other parts of data science, machine learning workflows, if you will, uh, that are dense where they're typically compute limited, like, you know, training stages of a pipeline. Um, so there's a, a free download if you want. There's a, a mini book that Dean Wampler and I did called Hardware is Greater Than Software, Greater Than Process. And we did this with NVIDIA recently with some of their open source leads from Rapids. And, and this is related to a kind of general view of data science is that, you know, typically we're managing dimensionality. You know, we started with, with a lot of very sparse, unruly data, very unstructured. And then we move through pipelines, we progress more and more towards structure. And that's a lot of what we tend to do in data science is I, I think a lot of the right reason. And it's really leveraging this trade-off between symbolic and numeric representation at different points. 
So that's kind of the thesis for, say, graph data science, if you will. So uh, I want to mention about uh, a project we have called KG Lab. This has been going on since last October, so about a year. Um, and the idea is that we wanted to explore graph data science. Um, AI workloads often require complex graphs, especially for data integration, but basically preparing data that we want to train in, in machine learning models. Um, and a lot of the, the different camps in the graph technology space, they're very balkanized. Uh, they don't talk with each other. A, a lot of the stuff out of the W3C stack, I mean, some of that stuff was started back in the late 90s, you know, and the code is really, really awful. Um, so we wanted to have a way to basically bring these different camps together and make them very Pythonic, make them work with PyData technologies. So if you're working in Pandas and Scikit-Learn and Dask, can you then go out and use things like NetworkX and PyShackle and, and uh, you know, uh, PSL, which otherwise wouldn't have a really clear integration path? <clears throat> so we've been working on, our team has been working on an open source project. Uh, it's gained some popularity. Uh, it's an abstraction layer in Python to bring in these different kinds of graph technologies and blend them in with a PyData stack. Um, and it's really taking a mind toward how can we leverage a lot of good distributed systems infrastructure like Dask and Rapids and, and leveraging Arrow, Ray, Spark, and then looking forward toward things like Legate. Um, and just to show you what's going on here, uh, you know, we, we have definitely provisions. We leverage a lot of RDF libs. So if you want to construct a graph using triples, you know, this, it's very well defined. Um, in KG Lab, you define a namespace, you create an object, and then you start adding triples to it. Uh, if you want to be using different serialization formats to import large data sets, uh, we've integrated for all of the W3C formats, um, but then also for JSON-LD. Uh, so we have a lot of different ways to bring in different kinds of data. Frankly, what we've, and, and actually there's even more obscure ways if you want to work with DOT or YAML or, or you know, GraphML, things like that. Um, one of the more interesting areas of this is actually being able to import from Roam research uh, because those are inherently graphs as well. Um, but what we're finding though is that Parquet, using Arrow, uh, using Parquet is the most efficient for serialization with large graphs and graph data or even small graph data. And I mean, it's orders of magnitude more effective than using other formats. Um, and it's also native for things like Spark and, and Trino and, and Cassandra. Um, in terms of visualizations, you know, it's really nice to be able to pull in a bunch of different data into a graph, run some graph algorithms, and get some visualizations. And previously, there weren't a lot of good integration paths for this. So now, you know, once you've got your graph built and you've run some processing with graph algorithms, maybe you want to go visualize by using something like PyBiz or Cairo. Um, Graphistry is another one that I really, really love to use. Um, and if you want to run queries, there's support for using Sparkle. So, uh, you know, you run a Sparkle query through it, but you get an iterator with name, name tuples or a pandas data frame as the output. Again, trying to really make this fit well. And by the way, for each of these different areas of technology, I'm trying to link in playgrounds. In, in the graph space, we often have something called a playground where you can go and, and try out some queries or try to work with some data just in, in a small constrained environment. Um, there's also really great in work in terms of validation and prescription. It, it's kind of like building unit tests, but it's uh, something more recent called Shackle that allows you to um, have shape constraints. Um, and so this way you can sort of apply tests to a graph. And then there's a wide range of graph algorithms. I love using KuGraph from NVIDIA, also NetworkX and iGraph. There's a lot of different work going on there in this space. Um, and of course, the big news is with graph neural networks and leveraging embedding. Um, so, you know, we've got some tutorials that show how to do all these kinds of stages. We, we've got a progressive example that we're using from uh, data from food.com uh, out of a, a Kaggle data set. And the other one that I really like that's a little bit more obscure is something called PSL. Uh, this allows you to work with uncertainty and apply probabilistic rules to a graph and be able to test it for, for certainty. This is an area of something called statistical relational learning. And, uh, and, and it works really well when blended with these other technologies. So we're bringing that into Python. And what I want to show here is there's many different angles about inference. You can be doing something that's very strict and axiomatic. You can be doing something that's very loosey-goosey like graph embedding, graph neural networks. There's a lot of points in between. 
how can we mix and match and build pipelines that are basically hybrid AI that, that combine different parts of these and put them together? Um, and so we have this project called KG Lab. Uh, again, it's an abstraction layer for this. And uh, one of the kinds of applications is in NLP. Uh, a lot of NLP natural language understanding is essentially taking text uh, to construct graphs. And then there's a project called PyTextRank uh, that uses uh, very efficient entity extraction from, from graphs based off of uh, text graphs. Okay, um, I'm running out of time, so I want to go to some questions. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I am on Twitter at Pacoid, and uh, I look forward to talking to you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Paco, for this excellent <clears throat> talk. Um, so we have a question from uh, Philip. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Hi, yeah, hi. Yes, I think that's we can. determining factor. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, so most of the time when I see graph problems in the wild or in my experience, um, they are modeling uh, a single relationship, a bunch, a bunch of different entities. Um, rather than a diversity of relationships um, mm. that you might see in uh, the setting like uh, modeling ecological systems. Yeah. Um, do, uh, are there strategies or technologies or is, is this a, um, uh, a different type of graph problem than what would be addressed through these libraries? Um, yeah, no, this is a really good point. I mean, especially if you're using Network X, it's sort of dictionary of dictionaries. Um, if using Network X or using tools like PyBiz, they, they really oversimplify the graph relationships uh, such that you just have this sort of edge representation and they, they throw away a lot of the relationship info. Um, so a lot of the end tools when you're doing a particular thing will actually throw away. And that was part of my argument about how in algebraic graph theory, you have these transforms from a graph into say a tensor or a matrix. Part of the problem with converting a graph to a matrix is you throw away information like this. So yes, if you're using RDF lib, um, you can have a, a lot of complex uh, types of relationships modeled. And then what we're doing in KG lab is we have a, a consistent way of doing transforms and inverse transforms, similar like in, in scikit-learn where you, you have uh, transforms for labels. Um, and so that way you can have your data and then pull a subset of it transform it into a dense representation, crunch it in network X, and then bring it back, bring the results back into a much more richer space that's that's not uh, see, compacted. But the, but the computation is typically done on a single relation structure. Not not necessarily, no. I mean, you can, you can pull a subset and then represent these in different ways. Um, so no, that, that, that there, are, there are better ways. I mean, it, Again, you know, kind of looking at some of the earlier uh, uh, graph approaches, especially when things were very much focused on non-negative matrix factorization, um, it was really difficult to have multiple kinds of relationships modeled uh, because very quickly you get into requiring tensors, not matrices. Mm -hmm. um, but these days, it turns out, you know, I mean, when I was teaching this stuff in 2014, I would mention graphs and half the class would run screaming in the opposite direction. And then I would say, but a graph is really a tensor. And then, like the entire class would empty out. Um, but you know, shortly thereafter, Apology. there was something called. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I hate to interrupt this uh, this uh, fantastic conversation, but we uh, have run out of time. Certainly. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, have a nice rest of the conference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.